Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we have a huge show, amazing show. Team Legacy has some updates coming to you right now. We've got World vs. World. Oh my god, this thing is huge. We've got a supply system. We've got siege weapons. We've got camps, towers, keeps. Stone Mist Castle. We've got the Eternal Battlegrounds, Orbs of Power in the Borderlands. We've got mercenary scoring systems. We've got sponsors and coloring players. Are they colored? No, they're not. Sally ports. We've got special league maps. We've got stitched together special maps. PvP lobby. We've got moody actions from all the crew. Trades and explanations around trades and works. We've got character creation. We've got this. We've got amazing fights. We've got killing games. We've got PvP mapping deals, overflow services, and Billy unlocks. It's gonna be a great show. Stay tuned. That was amazing. Yes, welcome one, welcome all. I couldn't do the smooth transition because that was actually a video. <laughs> Whoops. All right, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria, ladies and gentlemen. I am Bridger. I'll be your host for this evening. As always, this is episode number 19. I think we may be officially able to declare this the, uh, the first of season two of Tales of Tyria. Season one was all the uh, the pre-beta stuff before we knew what we knew. Now we're officially in beta, even if it is only a press beta. I know we've been in closed beta before, but this is the big one, right? So this is episode yes. one of season two. And uh, joining me, as always, I have my great co-hosts here. Welcome, Kai. Hi, guys. Whee. Joining us all the way from the United Kingdom. We are all very excited. Let's jump right over here to Freelancer. Hello, sir. How's it going, Bridger? Excellent. Oh, man, so good. And finally, Vega, welcome to the show. Good evening. And we're going to have some other people hop on here from time to time today, hopefully to talk to us. Uh, I know Malkior uh, is is very excited to come on and, and share his thoughts, so we might have him drop in at, uh, at one point. And uh, let's just jump right into some early sort of, uh, hey, here's what's going on news. So this is the deal. I think what we're going to do is have uh, two different uh, sort of sh pseudo shows tonight. We're going to do an entire show that's basically all about the crazy world versus world information that we learned and then we're going to do an entire show about all the other stuff that we've learned uh in the past 24 to 48 hours here so that's how we're going to structure it so there'll be a very short break in between i'm expecting that we're going to go for a very long time with that in mind there are show notes you can find at talesofteria.com you can also uh, i'll link them in the chat right now for people who are looking for them shorten the link and click and if you're listening to this after the fact you'll find those show notes at talesofteria.com or and the description of the YouTube video that you're watching. So, first thing is first, Tales, uh, uh, I mean, there's tons of big information today, but the very most important is that TeamLegacy.net has had a makeover. Well, at least that was the big news until today, but uh, that's the first on the list because yeah, I wanted... <laughs> <laughs> until today. That's the first on the list because I did want to just get it out of the way and let you guys know TeamLegacy.net has had a big uh, sort of makeover on the front page. Big uh, new new look. Uh, the forums are really starting to heat up with all this new information. But more importantly, Tales of Tyria in collaboration with Team Legacy is looking to launch a new show sometime in the next few weeks as we go further into the beta. This show is going to be more focused directly on very uh, hardcore PvP type stuff. The, the competitive esports scene of Guild Wars 2, as it were. Uh, if you've ever seen State of the Game, that's a, a show uh, that, that you may have seen before. It's a very round table, more like an ESPN style. Let's talk about this player. Let's talk about that player. Let's talk about this team. Here's how what we're going to expect from them. Here's the kind of defensive strategy that they use, etc. So it's much more nitty gritty details than this podcast will be but of course both of them running simultaneously you'll have your Tales of Tiro on, uh, on Sunday and then we'll have a different recording night for this uh, upcoming PvP show uh, Freelancer is actually going to take over the organization and uh, sort of hosting duties of that show I'll be on there as co-host and uh, Freelancer I believe you had some uh, ideas to have other co-hosts on there as well Absolutely. We got a, a few people lined up. Uh, we're talking with a uh, couple of big names. I don't want to make any any uh, announcements yet, but we're uh, a lot of the people we dealt with back when we did interviews with StarCraft and uh, Team Liquid, we're bringing some of those faces that we did written interviews with actually on air. So uh, you guys will definitely recognize some of those. Um, 
it, it's it's one of those things that a lot of you guys are happy about PvP. You're excited. Not everybody wants to hear about the you know the details of tournaments and turn you know big esports names and stuff that may not be your thing. So we're throwing out this this new uh, this new podcast slash stream uh, with Bridger and the gang and uh, aiming towards that group of people that want to talk balanced discussion that want to talk with. Uh, the latest teams that are in structured PvP. Yeah. They want to hear about that. And let me point out that that, so. that doesn't mean that Tales of Tyria is going to stop talking about no, PvP. No, no, no. Obviously, not we're still going to have tons of discussion about PvP. Um, and it's just not the nitty gritty about this team, that team, what's the latest build, etc. For those hardcore details, we're going to look at this other show. And the reason that we mention it now is we're just getting you guys ready, and so this is coming. But we also are looking for naming ideas. Uh, so if you guys have any good ideas on what we can name this show, I mean, sort of things that have been pondering around in my head is like Tales of Tyria, the Mist edition or something, but I haven't come up with anything, uh, we haven't come up with anything really solid. So if you've got any naming ideas for what this PvP-oriented show could be, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Feedback at TalesofTyria.com if you want to submit us an idea, and if your idea gets chosen, you'll get credit. <laughs> <laughs> you get a cookie. You'll you get, get a, a cookie. cookie. Uh, so there's that. That's out of the way. Let's jump right into it. Guys. Wow. Did wow. you guys see the scale of this thing? It's amazing. First reactions upon seeing the world versus world stuff. Incredibly exciting. But uh, look at the size of that castle. Speechless. The thing must I... be the size of the Empire State Building. Maybe not. I actually fighting anyone because i've been lost the whole time but, but see that map is so intuitive though i mean you saw that guy when he went to the mini map you could see where the battles were going players dying you could just zoom in on them immediately yeah it, i mean what other mmo has that right now i'm gonna anyway. try to pull up some screenshots for those of you that, that may that, not have seen the it the overview map is just incredible How yeah much? the overview map by itself is it's just look, looking at all the different terrains and all the different areas you know like you could cut across the, the water here and there and it's just outrageous Yep, I, I yep. think uh, they went above and beyond with their world vs. world ambitions. I think I have a, well, we've got the world vs. world uh, uh, arena net blog that we got last week, sort of early. And let me see if I can pull this link up here. Uh, there we go. So let's take a look at this, if I can swap to the correct uh, situation here we've got that one there we go so here's a, an image of the overview of the world versus world maps that we see obviously the bottom center one is sort of that middle one the one that they call the eternal battlegrounds with stone mist <laughs> castle in the middle uh, in this situation actually what we found out by listening to a lot of these videos is that arena net staff was playing on the red team with uh, a bunch of other people. And I guess green maybe was a lot of the one type of press and blue was a different kind of press. That was kind of an interesting way they, they divvied it up. And for, I guess, a long time, Friday into Saturday, the arena net red team was dominating everything. And then they, they couldn't do it anymore. And then green came and stomped the whole world because red logged off, essentially. Uh, obviously, <laughs> we, we won't necessarily have those same kind of problems in the, uh, in, in the official game because it will hopefully be more uh, organized. Um, but you can see also that the two, the three home maps, the maps that are controlled by the original, uh, I are identical in this version. But there have been some little birdies suggesting that that will not always be the case, that they simply used the single map that is most complete and most balanced for this test because they wanted everything to go smoothly. So there's that. And, uh, oh, this is sideways. That's weird. Um, here's an example of the, uh, the world versus world... Why is this sideways? <laughs> Just, you know, you gotta. It was not sideways this that. afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's interesting. That okay. would be the center map, right? That's the center I'm map. I'm looking yeah. at it awkwardly. So north is actually the left side of your screen in this case. Yeah. But yeah, um, if you guys remember the old leaked, uh, well, yeah, I guess it technically was leaked. World versus world map. The, this map actually back when it was. Uh, Heck, what was it like six months ago that mm -hmm. it leaked, or not, uh, if not more than that? It was nothing like it is now. Like the detail they put into just that middle stone mist uh, keep, castle, whatever you want to call it, uh, is, is incredible. And the, when you saw the guy um, from IGN running around it, it was just massive. To get from one there side of this castle to the other was, yeah, there you go. Uh, it, it was amazing. Um, it was a little. I was kind of sad not to see any battles going on there in any of the videos that I watched today, but uh, 
just the detail in that one map was was pretty pretty exciting yeah and and we also learned a lot of other details from watching all these videos uh so let's let's sort of go over them here bit by bit i'm trying to keep an eye on the uh on what's going on in, in the chat room, but it's just scrolling so quick. So here's here's one of the things that we learned uh, is the supply system. Obviously, we we learned a lot about the supply system on the Arena Net blog, and I'm just going to assume that everybody's read that because I don't want to regurgitate that when we only have so little time here. But here's some things we learned from the videos. Keeps hold about a thousand supply, at least the ones that I saw. He went over to the depot and it says a thousand supply or something in the keep. Storm Miss Castle, however, the middle castle, the, on the, on the biggest castle, holds 1,800 supply, so 1,800 supply. And the cost of siege weapons is about 20 to 30 for the ballista, catapult, and arrow cart, and for the big ones, the siege golem and the trebuchet, it's about 100. Now, you should also know that each individual person seems to be able to carry a maximum of about 10 supply. So it takes two to three people to set up a ballista catapult or arrow cart and about 10 people to set up a siege golem or a trebuchet. I didn't get any idea of how much it costs to upgrade the fortifications and things like that. I didn't see any, any things like that while I was going through today. Anybody check that out at all? Well, I do remember kind of what you were saying about supply. I do remember seeing one video where the supply was over uh, 2,000 um can't recall which one, but I'm pretty sure that... I wonder if you can they, upgrade the supply depots with Absolutely. The supply. Uh, they were saying during uh, Mike's uh, little little article he put out on World vs. World that you can upgrade two things. One is the structure of the uh, tower, et cetera, itself, and then also the personnel. They kind of split it into two categories. Mm -hmm. I would imagine uh, upgrading the, uh, however you want, infrastructure of the castle also includes supply. So... Maybe you can expand total supply. I mean, that would be the idea. Isn't there? I guess. Wasn't there also uh, guild perks that the more sort That's of you can level, level up your guild, the more you can sort of change your. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much. I think there was something in there about supply that. Yeah, that was um, like because like guild perks. when they when they did the uh, when they started the beta, they put everyone into their own guild or the the, the heroes of Tyria. Yep, yeah. Just so everyone could see that the guild system. So meant, yeah, yeah, and that was a good idea. That was good to see. Absolutely. So, uh, did anybody get to see any shots of the siege engines in action? I saw the golem. The yeah, golem. I, did, did, I think I might have saw, seen a video of the golem bashing yeah, down a door. Golem, it looked like you need a golem in... because it takes a long time for people to do it. It's going to be yeah. a lot like Warhammer. You know, it, having the ram there is nice, but if you get enough people together, um, it seemed like. Uh, it doesn't really make all that much difference. It's more the Golem or the Ram and Warhammer was a uh, kind of just an addition. It's uh, what I'd like to see is uh, that I didn't see is how effective those uh, those keep wall defenses and those tower wall defenses. Uh, I think they're actually they're pretty, are. I think they're pretty damn effective. That the one Golem didn't even do any damage to the door. He walked up to the door and just got. I mean, he lasted a while. He took a lot of damage, but. Um, I guess there were just so many people on the door, guarding the door, that he really didn't even get close enough to do much damage. Or the person that was controlling the golem just wasn't very good. Which yeah, was one I, of those two things. Ability. That was a big complaint our... I saw with people like, these videos are great, but I want to see a video of someone who's not terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was the case of a couple of people. I wish I could have gotten in there. I could have showed you what it looks like for somebody who's moderate. <laughs> I guess there's that. Uh, so... So the siege engines are really cool, and I, I kind of we, we kind of saw some videos. The IGN video shows uh, you know a, a lot of people busting down a door and showing how it works. We also noticed um, there are those sort of portals that you can use to go through the walls. If you own the keep, you can go in and out of those uh, portals. I think they're, they're basically the equivalent of a sally port in castles where you could go out the side and attack the besiegers, sort of harass them from inside the castle. Uh, those That's what those are called. So I'm going to keep calling them sally ports because that's pretty much what they are. Uh, so I think that's a pretty unique and interesting thing to, to have there because, you know, if you want to go and attack the, the besiegers, but you can't get back in because the doors are closed. I mean, they would have to implement some way to open the door, but then that would be a little bit of trolling. So what do you guys think about these sally ports? Are these a good idea, or are they just weird because it just breaks the illusion? Well, having played Warhammer for so long, um, one of the big problems in RVR, uh, is what they called it there, it's just world PvP, uh, was if 
I was running a guild, and let's say our guild was or our, our keep was under attack. It would notify us. I'm sure it will in Guild Wars 2. And our obviously at that point, our job was to run to our keep because they didn't have any teleports like they do in Guild Wars 2. Now, running to the keep, um, w the key issue was you had to get to the keep door in order to get inside your uh, to defend this thing. So you'd have these kill squads of people waiting outside the keep door just waiting for your guild to come and try to save its own keep. It was hilarious but frustrating at the same time. Um, and this Sally door concept... Uh, it's <laughs> I hate I hate that name. I'm sorry, Bridger. <laughs> it's a sally, sally port. port. That's what it is. You sally, sally out of it. This concept, though, it it completely negates that. Now, I think it'll be kind of abused. Also, I can. I mean, how? Not that we're trying to aim for realism here, but how realistic is it to? It's suddenly... a magical port. All right. You know the <laughs> password. You think the password as you walk towards the and wall and you, you walk through, through the, the wall. Enemies, right? You need the secret knock. You need the secret knock. <laughs> I, I just knock. see I just see a player like that has AoEs popping in, casting his AoE on the guys attacking the keep doors, and then popping back real quick. Well, what just makes like him not be able to them, do that you know? from the from the castle wall? Well, they could be attacked back, you know? And well root him down. You've got you've got the ability to stun people in place. If he pops out, you gotta be ready <laughs> for him, man. Get right in there. So we'll we'll see, but uh, it, it's a cool concept. I like the idea of being able to support your keep uh, in a much easier manner. So I like the idea that you know you aren't punished for having a keep if the doors are shut. You don't have to like find a way back in. Like it is cool that you can just like pop back in because you just went out for a certain reason. But like freelancer said, just to be able to pop out, damage people, and run back in and like hide, it just seems a bit odd. I think there should be some restriction. Maybe you have to be out of combat for like thirty seconds or something like that. But yeah, it seems like you could just go out and then kill people and run back in again. So, here's another thing. We were talking about the siege engines attacking the castles. I also saw some pretty odd... I mean, they had mortars on the walls. They had the ability to, to dump, like, boiling oil down onto people that are attacking a door. I mean, that seems awesome. I mean, it seems like you have sort of a, a, a small amount of time to where you can... Uh, dodge out of the way of the of the molten thing turning over. So I can imagine sort of attacking a door and have everybody you know sitting over there blasting on the door or a golem or what have you, and then have somebody sort of standing back as a lookout. And then when he sees somebody trying to activate this cauldron of lava or whatever it is coming out of there, they go get out of the way, and everybody tries to dodge backwards at the same time. That would be really interesting to see. Uh, the the mortars would just allow people and the cannons and stuff from the from the battlements were like get out of here. So. <laughs> I thought those were really cool. What did you guys think about those? I saw one of the mortars uh, launched. Uh, it was one of the many IGN videos that was released. Uh, the guy firing a, one of the mortars at the group of players. And numbers just shot all over the screen. And it, we're talking the thousands of damage uh, to giant groups of people. So if that's just one mortar on a wall that probably could have you know 10 or 20 of these on like the, the central castle... I gotta tell you, that's exciting. I it mean, is. I mean, now, if you can coordinate your guild, it doesn't matter if your guild's 10, 20 members. Right there, you are credit to server. I mean, <laughs> you will be able to work with everybody else and coordinate these kind of things. It was just exciting to see that. And um, I am kind of worried. What do you think, Bridger, of this? Um, there... Ergs are not still prevalent in World vs. World? Uh, No. The only thing that I could think of is because in, in sort of the, the matches that we saw, there was one big group kind of going around attacking things together because obviously the populations may not have been that high. I mean, even if they gave out keys to a thousand different press plus friends and family that are already in these betas and things like that, I mean, let's say even 1,500, divide that up. Over out of people that are playing the PvE experience, divide that up over time, over the course of the weekend. Even if everybody's playing all the time, they're not always playing at the same exact moment. So I, I could see, you know, one group of 100 or 150 people in World vs. World on each map sort of just zerging together because, or maybe not 100 people, but 50, 50, one big group, 50, whatever. So, however, considering the fact that there are so many objectives in a single map, it seems to make sense to split up and at least have smaller Zerg parties because a single Zerg that goes around capturing one keep after another isn't going to be as effective as two smaller Zergs capturing multiple keeps simultaneously. So I think the sheer number of objectives 
is enough to maybe kind of at least make not a single giant Zerg group be dominant. Yeah, well, and I can hope. We also got to consider that the maps are capped too, so mm -hmm. yeah, it won't get too out of hand. But what do you think, Kai? Well, I think ArenaNet did kind of address that in their original blog post about the World v. World that happened the other day. I can't remember what day it was, but when they gave us all the World v. World information, they actually did state that, you know, it wouldn't be beneficial for everyone to run around in one big group because the way you win is by capturing and keeping objectives and you wouldn't be able to keep them the, the long duration that you would if you were just running around in one big group. So they did actually state that it would be more beneficial to split up, have smaller parties, capture more objectives rather than just going around and zerging, you know, everyone that you see and capturing one objective at a time. So I think they will try and make you capture more, but obviously you will get the whole Outrack Valley experience where everyone just kind of rushes to the end and captures the big keep and, you know, tries to win that way. But I think because it is over a two-week period, if you just keep zerging constantly for two weeks, I think people will get bored, so eventually will try and do other objectives as well. Now, here's another interesting thing. Thought. I noticed that the only places that you were able to spawn were these waypoints, and the waypoints were only located in either keeps or the central castle. Uh, towers and camps did not have any waypoints. So, for example, if a if a if a tower is being attacked or a camp is being attacked, you can't just teleport to it and save it. If a keep is being attacked, you can teleport inside of that keep. Um, at least that's my assumption. I don't know if maybe the, the spawning slash teleporting system goes down when a keep goes under attack, but what that means to me is it kind of makes me think, okay, so if the defenders ever kind of get an upper hand and start killing the, def the, the attackers ever get an upper hand and start killing the defenders, the defenders can just sort of re-set up just respawn back in the, the defending keep. However, something that was mentioned in a number of different places was the point that you can basically keep repairing a castle sort of as it's taking damage as long as you have supply. But if the enemy is sitting outside your castle and you're not strong enough to escort the caravans to your castle or your keep, then that keeper castle is going to fall because as it takes more and more damage, if siege weapons are knocking down the walls, if uh, if 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 your if your uh, siege weapons that are on the walls are being destroyed, um, if the NPCs keep getting killed and you can't pay to upgrade them again, if those things, if there's no money, if there's no supply in the supply depot, then you're out of luck and that castle is eventually going to fall. So I love the idea of the fact that you can actually besiege a keep by actually like preventing supply from getting to it. That's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're going to have players that claim that keep, or the guilds that will claim that keep, like Kai's guild, all right? Deuces. They will claim <laughs> They will claim that keep and be like, this is our keep, damn it. And, you know, TL is going to come up and be like, you know what? This looks like a mighty nice piece of land. And <laughs> no matter how much Kai's guild wants to hold that keep, we could essentially surround it and choke it. And that concept, while there's been, you know, there's been castle sieges in MMOs in the past, the concept of being able to besiege a castle and, and eventually choke them. Starve them out. And starve <laughs> them out so that suddenly they don't have those, those defending, you know, uh, we'll say catapults and stuff on their walls anymore. They're running out of those. You know, we're killing them one by one, and now they can't repair their walls anymore. And it just gets to that point where they're so crippled, they eventually have to give up or fight to the bitter end face to face. So, I mean, that is exciting in itself. I like the idea that they make it where those stalemates, there's, you know, there still is a possible outcome. All right, so let me see, what else we got here? Uh, tons of stuff happening. So the spawning system, only on keeps, only on the central castle. Uh, I noticed that there was a lot of, I mean, if you look at this this map that we had up here earlier, there's another couple of times when we looked at the, the, they show these in the videos, and it looks like there is a lot more action than there is just on that sort of central map. I always kind of assumed that in order to get to those home maps, you kind of had to go through the central map, <laughs> but it appears that you, you might just be able to sort of spawn in on those other maps and, and decide, oh, I'm attacking your home area, or maybe you do have to walk through the, uh, the central map in order to get there. But take a look at the bottom center here, okay? Blue owns their section. 
and yet their home server has been invaded and captured a bunch of territories by red and green. So I don't know if this is an older period of time when maybe blue didn't own their, their section of that main uh, map, or if you can just, you know, run past all those keeps and towers and just teleport into the home area. I didn't see any writings about that. Is there anybody in the chat room that knows exactly how you get between these maps? Help me out if you saw anything that that, uh, that I missed. I only saw people teleporting between the same map. I didn't see how you get to the different maps. So uh, we shall see if the, the, the chat room can help us out here. Did you, you guys didn't see anything like that? So, yeah, that is a big question. Now, one thing I didn't see was... Also, I mean, how does one all right, start in their home map and then jump to the center map? Is that instantaneous? Is that as simple as a warp point? Um, or is that like something you have to run to or capture a point in order to get to? Um, you know, I'm hoping somebody that has played the game or somebody that knows can... Uh, is, they're saying they're linked by portals, but uh, surrogates. But the question is, do you have to own particular points on your home map in order to get to that center map? I don't know. Uh, purple Kai, portals. Did you Everybody's saying right? there's purple portals in the IGN video. Um, um, to be honest, I didn't bridges. watch like a whole lot of World v. World um, purely because I was more interested in like the dynamics of the game, like guild stuff and that. So, and unfortunately, no, I didn't see much. I did watch a few of like the golems and things like that, but I didn't see any portals. It didn't really occur to me to wonder how people got between maps, to be honest. Well, <laughs> we got a lot of people saying you... you they're not sure you have to own it but that that would be a good point to come back to on a later episode what if i don't want to even go to my home port you know what's what would be the idea just this just theoretical but if we know that the central keeps uh, the central keep is worth 50 points per 5 minutes right i yeah. think that's what it was right bridger yes um 50 points for per 5 minutes for your server in order to hold that central keep what were the point values for the other ones off the top of your head uh, it's 50 for the central storm mist uh, castle. It's 25 per keep. It is 10 per tower and 5 per camp. Okay, so think about this, guys. If you know that the central keep is worth 50 points per minute and you have, I think, three other smaller or we'll call them regular keeps in that area, which is 25, right there you have 100 or uh, yeah, 125 points per five minutes just holding the center map, not including the supply depots. So the question would be, why would I even go to my homeland originally if I can go there and be more efficient and claim that center? Unless I have to capture certain points in my homeland first in order to get to the center, which would make sense. You might so start it, with the points in your homeland, and then the enemy is going to invade those areas. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of points in your homeland, though. There is, let's see, uh, 25, 75, 85, 95, 100, uh, 110, 120, 100 and 30 points in your home map and in the center map total we've got 50 uh 75 100 125 35 45 55 65 75 85 95 100 so there's about 200 and some odd points wrapped up in that middle map but that's being fought over by all three people you start with about you know what did we say 130 or 40 uh, on that home map so you're trying to hold on to that 130 or 40 on the home map and take as many points as you can on the middle map um, I'm not sure how it started that, that's still some sort of questions that I'm trying to figure out and uh, I am trying to uh, to parse what people are saying here in the chat it seems like you can go into starting areas just via the central map uh, means in the central map you're middle of the three servers. So, yeah, I kind of get the idea from what these people are saying that it's tough to, to parse together what everybody's seeing from tons of different videos that if you get to the edge of the map, you can just invade somebody's home server and once you have taken a keep in that home server, then your teammates could just spawn there. That's my thought about how this worked out. Yeah. So we'll see if that's uh, if that's confirmed. I, I need to go and watch more videos. <laughs> I, didn't get to, I got to as many as I could. Well, we need we need ArenaNet. Hopefully they're listening to come out with uh, some sort of guide that kind of goes Mechanics. further into depth on this because so many, if you, <laughs> if you look at uh, a lot of different community sites, uh, Gurus talking about it, Team Legacy talking about it, uh, PvP, etc. They're all asking these questions, and I think they have a really nice article just out of the blue come up from ArenaNet saying, "Look, this is what we got, and this is beta because you know they're going to say this. They're going to say this is beta, so point values are not final." Of course, <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of explain this because it's exciting. We're all super excited about it, and uh, it'd just be really nice to know just how little things like that work. 
so let's see here. What else do we got to talk about? Ah, you know what I noticed, though, and what some people were worried about is, you know, I spend all this time getting this cool armor and getting, you know, the dyes that I want to make my character look badass or awesome or what have you, or maybe like Rainbow Bright, who knows, but... If I go into world versus world, and the only thing the enemy sees is a bright blue skin or a bright red skin, I mean, people saw the PAX videos and they were worried about that, but their fears seem to have been unfounded, because as far as I can tell, the only thing you need to worry about, whether something's a fr friend or an enemy in the world versus world, is if their name is green or red. If it's red, that's a bad guy. <laughs> you gotta watch <laughs> out. Uh, but their armor is still their own, and it's still dyed their own colors, as far as I could tell. Did, did you guys see yeah. the same thing? Yeah, they uh, they had original coloring. Um, a lot of them had guild capes. You could see the arena net cape. Yep. Um, couldn't really catch the detail on it, but you could tell a lot of different players when they were doing World vs. World had it. Um, I think it, I don't if the naming is a little confusing. I mean, you got to imagine they can't just do a green and red. You know, green being your teammates and et cetera, and red being them, because then you got this third, you know, team that, that's never been in the game before. So, I think it'll be a little. You know, imagine yourself playing for two weeks straight, and you're the blue guys, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next week, you become the red guys. Unless the color stays at all times. I don't know. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, I'd hope that they I, would just keep the enemies as red. I think all enemies are red. It's impossible to know if the team that you're, uh, that you're seeing on the horizon is you know, server X or server Y. Now that poses some problems to some degree because if their their whole concept of, oh, well, green is doing way too well, so red and blue might team up again. Uh, green and which one's red, how do you know who you're teaming up against who? I mean, you know what area you might go at, but maybe it's just the idea that, hey, everybody's an enemy. You don't need to know who they are. You just want to attack them if they're red. So, will And I don't know if I... I don't I don't know if I quite like the invader prefix they put on everybody's name too. Did you see that? Oh, I said it's written it, over their heads. That's one one little yeah, detail it's, I missed. It's giant and giant. You can't miss it. it. It says invader and then part of their name, and it's just it, when you see a mob of these people. Uh, again, going back to the IGN video, you just see like tons of names that, that say invader because it's so pronounced, and. You know, I don't. I didn't notice anything else but that it was just it was a little too much, I guess, because their names are already bright red. You can't miss it. I kind of wish you didn't. There was some other way to distinguish them find, besides the text. I mean, <laughs> visually, it would look really awesome to see like this this you know mob of people or or this you know group of players coming over the hill or what have you. But when there's this masses of text like flying floating above their heads, it really like <laughs> jolts me out of the experience. I mean, suspension of disbelief, whatever. But that's one thing that's just like wow, that just looks way wrong so i don't know we'll we'll see uh if that continues maybe you i'll be able to wait, turn uh, like uh like the little guys we're talking about here um imagining a guild named zim <laughs> or, or a or oh invader a zim i see yeah. what you did there <laughs> so you just see this giant mess of people <laughs> uh never mind going on did anyone thing. see um did anyone see any videos about like anyone allying with anyone else? Like, did anyone experiment with that during the press beta? Like, I didn't see anything because one thing that triggered it off when you said about earlier, Bridger, is there some way that you can actually literally ally with someone? Is it like a party invite? Is it pop up saying group like Team Red want to ally with Team Blue? Do you accept? And then like you know people decide to join the alliance, or is it just by word? Because people can like troll against that. Like yeah, we're allied with you, and then kind of like go behind them and kill them. No, all I don't think there was ever any promise of a mechanical way. You mean between two servers saying hey, let's form an alliance? Yeah. I don't think there was ever a mechanical way. It was more of a no. natural balance of power. If Green has taken over the vast majority of the middle map. Now, most of the targets for red and blue are green. They're not red and blue. So, naturally, red and blue are going to wind up attacking green because that's the thing they'll have access to because they okay. won't be able to attack each other anymore. So, it's sort of a natural way to, to do that as opposed to a sort of mechanical enforced way or anything to that effect. Yeah, yeah we know. I, I think it'd be far too difficult for two servers to also be like, let's go attack their keep at the same time because if you have you know, two groups that you aren't actually allied, so you can damage each other, trying to fight in a big clump, I but feel But you know, like. with the size of that central keep and some of the other keeps, uh, it might be possible to, for example, if you look on the map and you notice, hey, 
Green is being attacked from two different directions over there. Why don't we hit them from the other side and try to like sort of ninja this keep out from under blue? Like say blue is attacking the green central keep. Red can sort of wait until all of the de- the, the green defenders are on the other side of the keep and then come up and try to bre- break down a different door or break down a different wall and sort of kind of ninja their way in and, and sort of use blue as cover for their own attack. I mean, that would be, you know, that, that'd be very clever, very, very sneaky. Yeah, I could I could see that. I just think it'd be hard if like you have two giant groups that can hurt each other trying to storm the same position at the same time. I feel like that would get uh, complicated. Yeah, definitely. And then then it's just but... a giant free for all. Kill yeah. all the things <laughs> yeah. except the ones that can't be hurt by my own spells. Okay. So, um let's see. The PvP lobby, that's a really interesting concept. So did you guys uh, see, there was an IGN video, they sort of talked about it sort of briefly, but from what I could gather, when you join the, you know, you just, you click the button that says, I want to go to the mist, I want to PvP right now. Essentially what happens is you get taken to a PvP lobby, which is a 3D area where your avatar can walk around. Now, when you go there, even if you're level four, you're instantly given all of your spells, all of everything is unlocked completely all the traits that you could possibly want everything is unlocked as if you were in a structured pvp for example and you then get to test out anything that you want on a number of like test dummies that will show you how much damage they're taking and stuff so you can decide what the best build is how do you do these two things so it's sort of a combination of a meeting place if your guild is getting ready to go into uh, you know world pvp or you're get you know grouping up for a to set up for a tournament with with four buddies or what have you and it's also a place for you to test out your class so you could decide yeah i don't know my mesmer's okay but let me see how the warrior plays you make a level one warrior you go into the you go through the little tutorial thing it takes 10 or 15 20 minutes whatever then you hit go into the mists and then boom you're level 80 you can look at all of the warrior skills you can test them out against these little test dummies and decide you know what i kind of like the way the warrior plays as you know i'm not going to worry about leveling up a warrior because it's just not for me and that is amazing what how many times have you been in world of warcraft where it's like well i thought the hunter was cool when i was at level 20 but now i spent all this time getting him to level 50 and he's just ah he's too boring and it's like oh well i'm screwed now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of wish they would take those the the damaged. Uh, you know, they they show you the actual damage you're doing DPS and stuff on in that area, and I wish that those that functionality. I I, I understand their argument, and they they made an interview uh, or they responded to an interview about it about the fact of not presenting this during open world PVE, right? I, I, well, you I still, still get the damage things come up while you're in PVE. It's just that it's more of a controlled environment with a with an enemy that has about, zero. I'm talking about like within an entire party, so you can judge the oh, party's okay. that contribution, so to speak. We're talking, all you WoW fans, you know what damage meters are. You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Um, it's all of us are so that come from that hardcore rating environment are so attuned to being able to look at that and judge performance off of that. And I know it was broken in many respects, but it's. You kind of go into when you want to start doing, you know, those hardcore instances, the five mans we're talking about, the um, uh, the giant public events, and you want to really get efficient at that. You, there's right now, there's not really any way to, you know, say you need to improve or you're doing awesome, you know, and uh, you get a little gold medal or a silver medal, but what does that really tell you? You know, does that mean you just revived a lot of people? Does that mean you're truly putting out the damage you need to be putting out? And I don't know. I, I'm just hoping to see that what they put into what you were just talking about, Bridger, comes a little bit more out into the public scene. Yeah, and and this is something that sort of. I mean, while we're talking about the PvP lobbies, which is really cool, and I was. And then, by the way, once you jump into World versus World, uh, you you put back. Uh, the you get put back scaled down to level four. You lose all the unlocks that you haven't legitimately unlocked through leveling up. So what happened is I saw this guy in level four, and he's only got like his heal skill unlocked. He hasn't unlocked any of his other utilities. Then he goes into the the mists, the the, the lobby level, and he's got everything unlocked. And then he jumps into world versus world, and he's still got the same amount of high level of health and damage and scaled up everything, but he doesn't have all of his stuff unlocked yet. He still doesn't have all his trait points and everything like that. I don't know about the traits, but he doesn't have all his skills unlocked. So that's still a really interesting way to go about it, and I'm very excited to see how it works out. Now, here's something that I think uh, people were talking about, uh, and Martin sort of confirmed 
how this works, if I recall correctly. Uh, the uh, overflow, uh, overflow servers. Have you guys uh, heard about that? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. I think that's really. I think that's cool. They like want you to still be able to play even if you're not on your dedicated server. But um, we still don't really know how servers are working in Guild Wars 2. Are they working like Guild Wars 1 or are they working like Swator and WoW? So I think this makes it more like there's going to be actual servers rather than like Guild Wars 1. Yeah, so let's explain it to everybody who hasn't seen it. This, um, this idea is that if you go to Q with your guild, an example, and it, it doesn't have to be world versus world. I'm just using it as an example. Yeah, I think it's any sort of um, thing any that sort you have of, to portal into. Yeah, any instance, any zone, etc. So let's say you go to join this zone or this uh, world v. world raid, which is where I really think this is going to come into play. Um, and you want to join your guild, and there's other guilds out there, and it, it's just full. you know. And, and it's like, okay, well, most MMOs are going to give you this message that says it, it's full and you can't join. Okay, or it's something along those lines. Aeon was really bad for that uh, in the early days. Um, and so you're just bummed out. You tell people on TeamSpeak, I can't get in. It's full. Well, what they're doing in, a, in a Guild Wars 2 is basically placing you in this uh, metaphorical queue. But while you're in this queue, you're placed into an equivalent zone that has nearly everything exactly the same. Obviously, your friends and your players aren't there, but what it allow you to do is if you're doing PvE, you can go and work on quests. You can go work on achievements. You can go grind out this, or you can go finish up that. Um, and then when that queue is ready, you can just instantly flip over to the side where your friends are. And so that allows you as a player, you don't have to sit there and wait in a queue and just kind of twiddle your thumbs, you know, and and uh, be bored. You can be doing what you enjoy doing, and then when you're ready to join, bam, you're in there, you're ready for uh, action. And that's amazing. That and that is, solves the technical you know, problem of too many people trying to be in the same map at the same time. So exactly. that's mm -hmm. just, oh, I can't even, that's, that's, that's great. So, so, but this isn't taught, so does this also relate to, um, I mean, does it kind of carry over to, let's say I'm on server X and my friend's on server Y and his server's full. Can I still kind of do the overflow thing if I want to play on his server? Well, I don't think you're going like to necessarily have, kind of thing? I don't think you're necessarily going to have like sort of free range of changing servers like you did in Guild Wars 1. I think what we heard is that when you, it's sort of a combination of Guild Wars 1 and like World of Warcraft style, like, like uh, realms. And the idea is you're going to join a single server and you're going to create a character on that server and you can change that character over to another server but there's a cooldown. You can only do that once every so many days. I don't know if it's a week or two weeks or three weeks, what have you. And after you have changed from one server to another, you may not go into um, world PvP until that particular world PvP cycle ends. So you can't use the server changes to sort of spy and then go back to your other server and sort of tell everybody, oh, hey, check it out. They're going to come in on the left or whatever. So uh, yeah. that that's sort of the way that it works. But I, I mean, it's not it's not great because I guess what would happen is say you're going to try and join the, uh, the 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 main eternal battlegrounds, the main middle area, right? And you know you want to join that, and you go into a queue, and you get put into an overflow server with a completely different status from your server. I mean, there's going to be other people playing there, but will he, your contribution isn't going to mean anything in the world versus world context, right? If you help, you know, Green take a camp in that overflow server. That doesn't mean anything to you because you're going to leave that overflow server soon and it's not going to reflect anything on your server. So it, it's kind of nice as, a, as a, something to do while you're waiting. And certainly in the PV, PvE areas, that's not going to matter all that much because you don't care you know, how much your contribution is applying. Yeah. You care about your achievement progress and whether you've done this particular quest or, or what cool quests are there. But... Um, you know, so it, it it'll certainly give you something to do, and it's better than staring at a queue. It, it doesn't, it's not perfect, yeah. but I like it a lot better than staring at a queue. I mean, what 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 is what isn't better than trying to log into WoW or Aeon or or during any of those launches and getting to a zone and then just not being able to enter? You just get a message and that's it. Sorry, you can't play today, or you can't <laughs> play for the next two hours, or you're in queue out of. 9,000 <laughs> and you know you have to wait an entire two hours to get in it's it's, it's bad over 9, yeah it's... <laughs> thank and, you for that <laughs> and so now <laughs> it was inevitable we we saw that one coming but uh yeah you know but you could work on just the the mundane things if you if you wanted just to blow past the time i like it 
So, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think of anything else that here that's in the uh, sort of world versus world realm. And then we're going to take a break and sort of start a new recording so that we can keep things separate. So it's not just one giant MP3 of doom when we're done with it here. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Any final thoughts on these uh, on these maps? I mean, uh, let's talk about the scoring system. Uh, we didn't really talk about that yet. I but love that. We, we noticed, uh, based on all the information that we had, that, uh, like we said, the keep in the center is worth double the points that any other keep is worth. Every other keep is worth about two and a half times as much as, um, as, a, as a tower, and each tower is worth about twice as much as a camp. That's the current numbers. Camp is five, tower is ten, keep is 25, and the center is 50. Those numbers sound pretty good to me. Uh, and the question is, how does that all come together? And every five minutes, how server holds, that number is applied. So there was a screenshot in one of these videos uh, that showed, you know, blue has X many camps, X many, you know, Y many towers, Z many keeps, and then they're getting a total of plus 175. And green has more, and they're getting a total of plus 320. So green is getting 320 points every five minutes, and the numbers were insane because by the end of the weekend, it was like 175,000 points for one team and 148,000 points for another team. So that really adds up. Now, based on that scoring system, let me ask you this question. Is the server that has more people playing, you know, throughout the whole day, sort of a more well-rounded server, going to be at a huge advantage over servers that have sort of a peak population, you know? Let's say that server X has players that tend to be on between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. And server Y, of course, has a bigger portion of their server on there, but they also have a huge chunk of their server spread out through that other time period when they can take keeps when there's no defense. I, I I think that that's just a common uh, no. You can't balance world versus world in that sort of sense because it, obviously if you have groups, dedicated groups that are on continuously as opposed to sort of peak times, you know, if you're talking about if a peak time is a few hours as opposed to a group that's on. You know, I have a server that's playing constantly throughout the day. I think the server that's constantly playing throughout the day is going to be able, you know, to take the little the little supply camps here and there and take the towers and take the strategic points. And that's going to give them a, you know, sort of an advantage in the long run. I mean, I can imagine, you know, North American servers trying to court European guilds to come up, come play on our server yeah. and get the Australians over too. We could use a couple more Australians. We're short in the morning. So, I mean, yeah, that's... That'd be... imagine if a guild purposely tries to recruit members from all various regions of the world just so that when they're playing they could constantly have a strong group of people running the world versus world no matter what time of day it is there might be some shenanigans going on on the, on the best that, servers in the game are going to wind up like having, you know, we got to make agreements. You're going to come on here. We're going to take the morning shift. You're going to take the evening shift and you're going to take the afternoon <laughs> shift. I yeah. think uh, I think realistically, though, assuming those little secret back door back room deals with the Europeans are being made. Um, <laughs> I, I honestly think uh, that peak servers will still have a major advantage because. You saw how long it took just 50 players to take down a, to a door at a tower. Now, imagine if you have a peak time that a server takes the entire map, okay, theoretically, okay? Even if you were the, the little bands of guys that get on at, let's say, two, you know, between two to three, or you get on an hour here or an hour here with your friends, you won't have nearly enough people to take down the door in efficient time, let alone attack the keep lord. I mean, think about that. So those peak times are kind of required. I mean, if I capture Stone Mist in the center of the map, and it takes my 150 guild members to do it, that's fine. But during the day, I'm not going to have to worry about that. I don't think even now in the current iteration of beta, I don't have to worry a single bit during the day because I know that even if little bands of players throughout midday in the, in the eastern United States got together at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they don't have enough people to even touch it. Now, that, the other thing that sort of came up is if you have, you know, four or five guys in that central keep, 
they can, you know, as long as you've got supply having been built up in there from the previous night or so, then they can keep init in initiating repairs or what have you, at, you know, until the, the guild comes on in an hour or two, you know, even if they're getting starved out, uh, if that small group is trying to take the keep, they're going to take a lot longer to take it. So the supplies will hold out for a longer period of time. There's, oh, there's just so many possibilities. But but also, going on with freelance, we're saying a small group can't take out a keep necessarily, but they can certainly stop supply lines and take supply camps and try and take smaller little areas. Yeah, I mean, imagine a guild which, that specializes in, you know, our time is going to be, you know, mid-afternoon on the weekdays when everybody else is at work. <laughs> we're only organizing people that are on at this time. This is when you're coming on, and they just take every camp on the entire game just so that when everybody else logs on they go what the hell now we got to spend a whole bunch of time running around these stupid dinky camps and not taking keeps uh yeah. well, that's that's an interesting one, idea one thing that like people are talking about in the chat like malkior said there's like for example my guild we're literally half eu half like north america so we're gonna have people playing at all times a day and currently we have like 400 people so say if we had like a hundred people online who are like European and then a hundred people online late on the day who are North American, we can like always world be world and have like a good number of people. So I think some guilds, if you know, it's possible to have EU and North America on one server, they will be able to take keeps and things at any time of the day. But you know, you have to be a big guild. I'm sure Team Legacy, you're quite a big guild. If you have a lot of European players as well, like you'll be able to do the same, but it just depends. I think we run into the issue there of of consistency. I mean, European players, for the most part, are going to play on European servers due to the fact they have European connections. And sadly, that's we live in a, so far, in a world where we're limited by those connections based by on our geological location. By the speed of light. Stupid yeah, speed I mean, of light. If, if we had, you know, these imaginary, you know, fiber connections that go from London to New York, <laughs> you know, it'd be a different story. But... I mean, I would love to see Europeans. I would love to be online in the middle of the day and see Europeans trying to take my keep because <laughs> I will tra la 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 shoot things at them and they will be so laggy that it'll just be hilarious watching them stand still try as to they dodge. get hit by my yeah and try to dodge myself. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is your ping 300? Well, it takes two milliseconds for this fireball to come at your head. So I mean, not only is the ping 300 milliseconds, which means three tenths of a second, it would take them to even see my fireball coming at them. <laughs> It would, it, for them, for the game to recognize their reaction to it, assuming it's another 100 milliseconds, one-tenth of a second, the game will spend another 300 milliseconds on the upload speed recognizing that they moved <laughs> to get out of the way of the fireball or catapult or whatever it might be. Um, uh, it's just, I think what we're going to find is that your casual players, the ones that don't have jobs or maybe the kids that play during summer or during the summer that don't have school are going to be the ones you find mainly online trying to organize stuff i think it's to be they'll be running around capturing random stuff anyway because you know they're having fun and there's nothing wrong with just having fun and just killing things for the sake of killing things they're not going to really be thinking so much about the grand scheme of i want my server to win world versus world i think that's going to be 100% set on the guilds that are playing during prime time because it's also the same players that I think you'll find are the ones that are most dedicated to the grand idea, the grand uh, vision of things. So in the middle of the day, I still stand by it. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong that during <laughs> during the middle of the day, yeah, sorry, Kai, you will not see any action in World vs. I'm going World. to take your keep in the middle of the day. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the days. And send it to you and be like, Mark, no, 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 no. The... And I'm going to make a character that says freelancer died, and then like, <laughs> that kind of your, your I don't know. That's there. the problem, though. I don't know if European uh, servers are going to be allowed to be in the same rotation with Amer North American servers. But if it is, every week that that uh, that Kai's Guild <laughs> and Freelancers Guild are going at it, like so we're matched up in the same thing, it is going to be all up in here, as it were, <laughs> or something. Like I don't know where that goes. Like, but but all of the guilds. All of the guilds out there, all of you guys that played uh, Warhammer, all of you guys that even more so, obviously, that played WoW, when were the hardcore, the serious rating times? They were never at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm sorry. No, no, they weren't, it, but but think about how many people are playing the game. All it takes is someone to say in trade chat or something, hey, we're going to go take a guild. We're going to go take a keep. Everyone, get in the world versus world. And all of a sudden, you got a group of, you know, 
20 turns into 30 and 30 turns into 70 and all of a sudden you got a nice group there granted they won't be nearly as organized as a real guild but you know don't underestimate the power of a bunch of zergs (laughs) (laughs) well they might be organized too you don't know that they're not organized organized zergs here we go it's a it's a good like think of it like this if if you were in a fight with a hundred five-year-olds and you were getting zerged by a hundred (laughs) five-year-olds would you be able to hold them off punch and kick if you want <laughs> child abuse do we do we condone child abuse that's how of course not okay, this is a metaphor like metaphorical child abuse is not actual child abuse the hundred the five-year-olds will win they will did i just you. say that <laughs> <laughs> oh boy if it's metaphorical, it's okay that having been said i think we may have just jumped the metaphorical shark <laughs> as it were. Uh, any final thoughts here on World vs. World before we jump on to the, uh, the other topics that came out this week? I can't wait to play Totally it. excited for it. I, 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 love, I love the whole concept of supply and, and all that. It it's gives, very uh, cool. It's very it gives, cool. It gives even the little guy, if you're just one person, you could still have a part in this huge battle. And I love that. So the only detail that I really want to know and that I couldn't find out in the limited amount of time I had to watch videos today, does anybody in the chat room know how much supply is delivered by a caravan? Because we kind of know how much about that keeps will hold. It's like 1,000 to 2,000. We know how much it costs to make trebuchets and things like that. You know, about uh, you know 20 to 30 for the small ones, 100 for the big ones. We know how much you can carry, which is about 10. How much does a caravan drop off at a keep? So let's let's see. It's definitely not ten. Players it can carry be ten. A <laughs> hundred isn't even enough. I'd think that each caravan would probably drop off about four hundred or three hundred yeah, at least. He said the oxen hold one hundred. Is that right? Okay. Everybody's, Everybody's saying, saying hundred. So maybe it's hundred. Or said it's over nine thousand. I feel like it's over nine thousand. No, but uh, I don't know if hundred is a guess. Hundred is your imaginary because you you don't want to inst- you don't have the ability to instantly That's fill true. up your supplies. That's true. But so the question is, like a... is it five hundred every hour? You know, the caravan comes, or is it like a hundred and it's coming two or three times or four times an hour? The other thing that I want to know is, do the caravans come automatically, or do they come when you initiate it by walking over and starting an event to initiate the caravan and escort it? Or do they automatically go and they'll go if you go to initiate it? And if you initiate it, can you detail, okay, from this camp, I want you to go to that tower, not to the main keep or something to that effect? Or does the keep uh, camp feed everything that's close to it? These are questions I need to know. <laughs> I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure you have to initiate it. And um, I, I can't remember if I've seen it, but I'm, I'm sure, pretty sure you that have there's to at least some automa- automated it. form because I'm pretty sure that, that, that yeah, a lot of people are saying caravans are automatic. It, it may be a like, combination of the two. I feel like they would be because as soon as you, I think as soon as you take the supply camp, then it's going to start, you know, producing like, supplies and sending it to the stuff that you control sending, and sending the caravan out. Because I think it'd be kind of lame if if you, every time you wanted supply, you had to run over there and tell the like the the freaking elephant thing. All right, go ahead, go. And then you know it's good having that automatic feature because then it gives you one other thing to have to worry about defending. Or attacking. All right. I want to get Malkior on here because he's going crazy in the chat. And uh, and I think he wants to join us <laughs> just for a short while. I'm going to see if he has any final thoughts on World versus World. Then we'll jump into other stuff here. So uh, let's see. Who, who are we going to lose here? Uh, Jay, do you mind stepping out for just a minute while we talk to uh, Malkior? Yeah, I'll, I'll reset all my stuff. All right. Well, let's, let's do that here then. Malkior. We're going we're gonna to hang up on Jay. How do I Hi, kick Jay. him out of the call? Remove who, who, who's from this, uh, who's this Malkir? You may guy. leave the big brother house. <laughs> I love you, Malkir. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can't add him to the group by dragging him over here. Ah, yes, there we go. Uh, let's see if we can get him on. Uh, I know he's been itching. He's been talking to the chat like, push us wrong, freelancer, why don't you talk about this the whole time? So we'll put his money where his <laughs> mouth is. If he's got his audio working, he's not even answering. Is he paying attention? Is he missing his big moment? Are you there? Uh, I don't know. Fail, 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 bro. Uh, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> All right, his video's coming in now. Uh, so, Malkior, did uh, we uh, miss anything? What well, did we? What are we? What are we missing here? Give him a sec. Let me mute one side. So, one. Are you hearing everybody? On? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Okay. All right. There we go. No, no, no. I muted on my end. I see. One bridger's 
plenty enough. Oh. <laughs> One of me. All right. So, what did we miss, Malkyar? What 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 are we missing here? What do we miss about World versus World? What do you got to add? Uh, I don't know if y'all really touched up on the automated balance system through the ELO. Freelancer's going like, watch me stomp over everyone, and then he won't be able to stomp over everyone. <laughs> ah. Try hard for each so, so, hard. How do, so how does that work? It, it runs on um, ELO system established through um, competitive games like StarCraft and League of Legends. With that, servers that, win, that frequently win the World v. World will be matched up against each other, whereas others that lose will be matched up against each other. It's a mathematical so algorithm designed to determine people's relative strength and weaknesses at a given task based on victories and losses. I wasn't going to give the Wikipedia description. That's, but that's the most descriptive <laughs> one. Essentially, if you win, you go up in a ranking. If you lose, you go down in a ranking. But it also takes into account the, the, the rank of your opponents when trying to determine how much you go up and how much you go down. So that system is being used in the background to, uh, to, to make sure that if Freelancers Guild Team Legacy, www.tnlegacy.net, is owning face, then they will start going up in the rankings in order to play against other guilds and, and other servers that are owning face so that it will not be so easy to own face anymore. And uh, um, I think that's the most time I've ever said own face in a single sentence. So, yes, I'm, I'm, under that I'm idea... I'm a little distracted by whatever Kai is doing. <laughs> <laughs> I want so, your t-shirt! <laughs> I got a question, though, Malkir. Under that, under that idea of the ELO <laughs> system, how long do you think it'll take for that to truly kick in before a server, any guild that's doing well, or any server that's doing well, good, good question. Um, to really start getting paired up against other equivalent servers? I mean, in uh, League, in League of Legends, you're going to be playing 100 games within a month. Okay, that's fair to say for anybody really playing it. But you, you're being faced or matched up against these other servers every two weeks. That's two times a month. So would it? Would you, are you, is anybody going to tell me that it's going to take six months before I'm actually paired up against no. a server equivalent? Listen, no? it's going to get no. better over time. <laughs> well, I'm just it, curious. It, I it agree, though. It probably will take quite a while. Oh, I, I think the matchups will begin after the first month. They can see, all right, which servers are consistent. And they got a number of features they can track. It's not only which server won. It's like, okay, this server won by like 500,000 points compared to this one that won mm -hmm. by 100,000. That's a very good point. So, you can plug those into the algorithm, I would guess. This will definitely be like higher tier than the other one. And so they can match them up with that. But I would say it'd take about two months before we start seeing – a consistent balance between the high tier servers and the low tier servers. Yeah, even taking out the fancy math, if you just had, okay, everybody who just won goes up against each other randomly seated, everybody who just lost completely goes up against each other randomly seated, everyone who came sort of in the middle of their three servers goes up against each other randomly seated, even doing that for, you know, three or four times in a row, you're gonna get a better system, a better matchup overall. And I think if you take into account, like Malkier said, exactly how much they won by in order to determine how much higher they go up in their in their ranking, that should, I think, by six months, give us a really good matchup every time. Maybe we'll start getting decent matchups, you know, around three or four months. We'll have to see. And for all you guys that are that are listening and thinking about this, you know, I like to throw out a lot of jokes to drive that competitive spirit. I like to up up talk my guild like anybody else kai as well but you guys really have to think about this because you don't want to be in that world versus world setup that uh where you just you go against this server and they their server maybe they don't have necessarily the most skilled players but they have just so many people that are always participating and you just don't stand a chance at all and it's no fun this, when you're 10 people exactly. against 50 it's just no fun and it's um you know it all jokes aside, you know, it's one of those things that it, unless they get this right from day one, your first two weeks, your your first two months, I guess would be the right way to say it, it you'll be constantly paired up against these other servers that are just have 500 or I guess what, 200 people, 100, 166 people per map that are just raffle stomping you left and right because you can't muster 30 people on your side to defend a point for example and I think that is a huge thing especially for first impressions because we all know how that works first impressions Star Wars anybody um, so 
it's uh it's definitely something we have to look into we don't want to make that mistake that star wars did with their world pvp you all know what i'm talking about um where it, it, the game was great it, it was going everything went well but then when you got into it they didn't think ahead in those respects and it just ruined that reputation of that pvp so that's my rant i'm done <laughs> <laughs> now there's also the possibility that if the numbers are really skewed, especially in the first couple of months when you're not really going to have equivalent play, but maybe they can even match that up. Um, you know, they could have multiple tiers within the ELO system and say, okay, well, we've tracked the last two, you know, uh, full, you know, the last month worth of World versus World and servers, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, these servers all consistently had, you know, average of 132 people playing in each map or something like that. These other servers had only 50 people per map or something to that effect. And they can use those statistics to sort of assign tiers. This is the high world versus world population tier. This is the mid low, you know, whatever. And it maybe use that as well as the background. There's a ton of different tools that they could use to help balance things. Yeah. And uh, it's, I, I just hope that, and so far what we've seen was amazing. I mean, it, it's still Zergy. We're, I guess all of us had a part of us that were hoping that, you know, it was going to be not so much based on the number of players you had, but, you know, the quality or maybe the technique and tactics. It's, I still very much saw a Zerg fest, but um, it, it's, you got to admit, it was the most polished kick butt Zerg fest you've ever seen. So um, it's, it's going to be good. Very good. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I think with that having been said, there was one more topic. Mercenaries. Uh, now, I only got to see a little bit of this in the video. I remember listening this morning, though, that Freelancer was going, mercenaries, mercenaries. We're just going to roll those things. They're going to be <laughs> worthless. It's not even going to be worth the time to help them out. It's like ogres it sure solve your not. own problems. Mercenaries Please are waste, a waste of our time. Please. You think Please so? Please enlighten me, because I have oh. no idea what you're talking what, about. What is a small band of NPC oh, oh. creatures How do you know how do? small it's going to be? How, what if they're all level 86? How do you know? And there could be like 50 of them. They could have families and relatives and <laughs> other mercenary friends who are going to come out as well. <laughs> they're Don't bringing up the entire me. family. <laughs> And this is why deuces will fail. No, I'm playing. Uh, <laughs> if you're constantly... My mercenary army will be their entire species, and they are coming for you. Not not for Listen. TL. They're coming for you. Listen. No. All right. Let's uh, let's get let's be realistic here. Uh, NPCs coming at you with NPC tactics and NPC mentalities and NPC AI. You will assign your. 10 guys at max to say pull these guys over here and that way we don't have to deal with them you know and if not that they you will have typically yeah where but they you would don't make think that distracting 10 guys for a good you know 15 or 20 minutes as these mercenaries stream in that's not going to be useful and when you're sieging a castle if the defenders have to send 10 of their guys to go deal with it not if I have 150 players at my disposal. What, you know, well, if you're talking about giant numbers, I can talk about giant numbers too. Why don't you send <laughs> six different mercenary camps at you? Now you're sending 60 of your guys to deal with Is the mercenary Is that possibility camp. there? Because if so, I have I don't know, but you're assuming there. it's not. You're assuming that they're only going to sap away 10 of your guys. But it, even if it does sap away 10 of your guys, that's one tenth of your strength if you're defending name, a keep with 100 name people. all the scenarios that possibly happen. <laughs> speculation! <laughs> speculation! All right. Bad. Bad speculation. <laughs> Bad speculation. What? Overseer cat happening. disapproves. I, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope you're right 100%. I won't say that often, Bridger. But... <laughs> you want the mercenaries <laughs> to be meaningful? I hope mercenaries won't. have <laughs> massive AoEs, and you can't ignore them, but I just don't see that. All right, so... Free he never admits that he's wrong. Just be with him long enough on TS, and you'll recognize that. No, only... I, have, I have high only... hopes for uh, World versus World. All right, so I guess everybody's uh, gonna try and kill Team Legacy as much as possible. You do realize that's that? Awesome. We, that's Team awesome. No, no, the bravado, ladies Legacy. and gentlemen. They just want freelancer. <laughs> they like give them to... <laughs> just, just Your like toss them up in a <laughs> like, What are you doing? <laughs> like throw them over the keep wall. Like go do something with him. We're gonna hold on to the keep and win. Yeah, Sitting around a campfire. Yeah. Freelancer was a great leader, and it's gonna be sucked to have to sacrifice him. It was slain the... by level eighty-six ogres. <laughs> <laughs> Geo, Geo mutiny on day one on 
day freaking one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that all having been said, I think it's time to take a short break and then come back and try to tackle everything else that's going in here. I mean, we've got the guild systems, how that's working. We've got traits. We've got uh, the Mesmer character creation the new PvP map, there's all kinds of stuff still to talk about. We're probably going to go for another half hour, 40 minutes easy. But for right now, we're going to take a quick break. I don't really have any music to play for you. So <laughs> I'm just going to put the countdown screen up here. I'm going to mute wait, this. Wait, wait. Just go find some Guild Wars 2 music. You kidding? I'm going. Just give me a second. I'll, I'll give me a second to get back from space. I'll, I'll <laughs> talk. I'll talk. I'm going to argue with Malk here for a second. <laughs> wait, Freeze going to talk? Okay, I'll shut up. No, uh, we're works? gonna we're gonna take a quick break, guys, so that I don't continue losing my voice yeah, we'll, here. We'll and, be back uh, in about five minutes or so. All right, let's 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 take it down. <laughs> 